So our next talk is by Dr. Janet Silicano. She's a professor of medicine at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And uh, both she and her husband uh, uh, have been working uh, in this field for many, many, many years and have really had a, a remarkable consistency of theme about latency, latent reservoirs. And that, of course, translates directly into cure. So we're real pleased to have Janet here with us, um, and she's going to give us an overview of latency reservoirs and cure. Today I'd like to provide an update on the search for a cure for HIV infection, and we'll discuss how we can measure progress towards an HIV cure. These are my disclosures, and these are the learning objectives for my talk. I'd like to start by reminding you of the magnitude of the problem. In the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, it's really easy to forget that currently 38 million people are infected with HIV, and the distribution of the epidemic is uneven. In some countries in Africa, 15 to 30% of adults are infected. Now, almost all of these people will die from AIDS without lifelong antiretroviral therapy, but currently only 23 million people are on treatment, and for reasons that will become clear, only three people have been cured of an established infection. To explain why cure is so difficult in this infection, I'd like to first review HIV replication dynamics in vivo. This is a plot of a level of plasma virus in a typical patient, and the units are in copies of HIV RNA per milliliter of plasma. Following transmission, there's rapid virus replication and a rapid exponential increase in the level of plasma virus. Now, this initial exponential growth of the virus in the days following uh, exposure generates immune responses that brings viremia down to a quasi-stable set point in about a month. Following initiation of antiretroviral therapy, however, there's a very rapid exponential biphasic decay in viremia from this set point down to the limit of detection of clinical assays. Now, the antiretroviral drugs very effectively block new infection in susceptible cells, but they do not prevent virus release from cells that are infected and have an integrated provirus. So therefore, this rapid biphasic decay actually reflects the rapid death of several two infected populations of cells that are producing most of the plasma virus. And there are two populations of infected cells, one that have a very short half-life of about a day, and a second population of infected cells that has a little bit longer half-life, um, but about 14 days. Now, if this is all we had to worry about, um, this infection could be cured in several months to years with antiretroviral therapy. But unfortunately, this decay does not continue, but plateaus at a new steady state of about one to three copies of a virus per milliliter of plasma. Now, this residual viremia does not reflect ongoing cycles of replication during antiretroviral therapy because treatment intensification does not reduce this residual viremia. But rather, residual viremia represents viruses that are being released from a third population of infected cells, which were infected prior to the initiation of treatment, but which have a much longer half-life. And this population of cells are lately infected resting memory CD4 positive T cells, which are the major barrier to cure, and they arise as a consequence of the normal biology of CD4 T cells. Most of the CD4 cells in the body are in a profoundly quiescent state. And these include um, resting, these resting cells include naive T cells, which have not yet responded to any foreign antigen, as well as memory CD4 cells that have previously participated in an immune response. And these resting cells are continually circulating throughout the tissues, awaiting encounter with antigen. And when that happens, the relevant cell becomes activated and divides, ultimately generating many activated effector cells with the same specificity. Now, this process of antigen-driven proliferation will become important later in the talk. At the conclusion of the immune response, many of these activated cells die, but some survive and return to a resting state as long-lived memory cells. Now, memory cells um, can persist for long periods of time decades, in fact, uh, thereby allowing future responses to the same antigen. In HIV infection, the virus replicates mainly in activated CD4 cells, and these infected cells die quickly, usually in a day, and that's what I just showed you in that viral decay curve. 
Now, the virus does not replicate well in resting T cells due to blocks and numerous steps of the virus life cycle. However, on rare occasions, some of these activated T cells can become infected as they're in the process of returning to a resting state. And this results in the stably integrated form of the virus genome in a long-lived memory T cell, a cell population that has a very slow decay rate. And what's particularly interesting is that as this cell undergoes this profound change from an activated to a resting state, HIV gene expression is turned off. And this is because of a complex molecular switch which turns on HIV in activated CD4 cells and turns it off in resting T cells. And so the end result is a stably integrated but transcriptionally silent form of the virus genome in a long-lived memory T cell. And this is the perfect mechanism for virus persistence because it allows the virus to persist essentially as pure information unaffected by immune responses or the antiretroviral drugs. And if the lately infected CD4 T cell becomes activated in the future, it can begin to produce virus. Now, currently, there's no approved clinical assay for the latent reservoir. However, the presence of lately infected cells was initially demonstrated with a quantitative virus outgrowth assay that was based on this model, in which to detect lately infected cells, you reverse latency through T cell activation. And in the quantitative virus outgrowth assay, resin CD4 T cells are purified from large blood samples, serial diluted, plated, and then activated with mitogen that causes 100% of these resting cells to become activated and to proliferate. Cells with latent HIV can now produce virus, which spreads throughout the culture, so that in two to three weeks, the virus that derived initially from a single lately infected cell becomes detectable by an ELISA assay for HIV P24 antigen. And then you can calculate the frequency of cells with inducible replication competent proviruses. Now we found these cells in the blood and lymph nodes of all patients, but only at frequencies of about one in a million. So this is a very small pool of infected cells, but the problem is, is that this infected cell population has an extremely long half-life measured in years, not days, thereby guaranteeing lifetime persistence, even in patients on optimal antiretroviral therapy. The newer antiretroviral treatment regimens have improved dramatically with regard to reduced toxicity and single pill formulation, but have not changed the fundamental problem of the slow decay rate of the latent reservoir. And so in order to achieve a cure, we need to eliminate this reservoir. And as I'll discuss, there's currently a large number of clinical trials of cure interventions. And so therefore, there's a need for assays to measure whether any of these interventions have reduced the latent reservoir. And I'll discuss one that's furthest along towards approval. The viral outgrowth assay provides a definitive minimal estimate of reservoir size, but this assay requires three weeks worth of intensive tissue culture work in a BSL-3 lab. It requires a very large volume of blood and is expensive. And so therefore, most investigators have resorted to simpler PCR assays to measure proviral DNA. Together with Steve Deeks, we've recently compared these different approaches. And what we found is that the most widely used PCR assays that measure proviral DNA give infected cell frequencies that are several logs higher than and poorly correlated with the viral outgrowth assay. An explanation for this difference has come from studies that have involved full genome sequencing, which have shown that most HIV proviruses have fatal defects. And in this figure, each horizontal bar is a single provirus. The white areas are MAP deletions, which eliminate critical HIV genes. The green proviruses are lethally hypermutated by a host enzyme called apoback 3 g Intact proviruses, which have the potential to cause viral rebound upon interruption of antiretroviral therapy, are shown in orange, and you can see that they're rare. Now, the standard PCR assays that you are used in most cure studies amplify only small regions of the HIV genome and missed effects encompassing or outside of the region being amplified. So these assays are a very poor way to measure the intact proviruses that represent the barrier to cure, but rather what we need are assays that exclude defective proviruses. Full genome sequencing is very slow and expensive. And so with this in mind, we developed the first scalable assay that selectively detects intact proviruses using digital droplet technology. 
And in this digital droplet assay, DNA from patient cells is distributed into nanoliter-sized droplets such that no droplet contains more than one HIV genome. Two PCR reactions occurring in each droplet probe informative regions of the HIV genome to distinguish intact and defective proviruses. So this assay, which is known as the intact proviral DNA assay, or IPDA, works like this. There's an optimized DNA extraction protocol and followed by droplet formation. Multiplex PCR reactions occurring in each droplet analyze the left and the right sides of the HIV genome and produce different fluorescent color signals shown here as blue and green. HIV genomes or proviruses with deletions at the right or at the three prime end will give a fluorescent signal only with blue amplicon and end up in the upper left quadrant as individual droplets in the stop top, as do hypermutated proviruses. Proviruses with deletions at the left or at the five prime end will only give fluorescent signal for the green amplicon and they end up in the lower right quadrant. Rare intact proviruses will give fluorescent signals for both amplicons and can be directly counted as individual double positive droplets in the upper right quadrant. The output is intact proviruses per million input cells. Now, the fundamental reason this assay works is that the lesions are generally very large and hypermutation extensive. So that with just two PCR reactions, we can exclude most effective proviruses that would be counted in other methods. IPDA analysis on a large number of treated individuals gives results like this. Intact proviruses, which are shown in orange, are present at frequencies of about 50 per million CD4 T cells. Now, this is much lower than the frequency of proviruses with different types of defects, shown here in blue and green. Now, like the viral load assay in untreated individuals, there's very wide variation from individual to individual. Now, it's important to understand how this assay is different from the standard viral load assay that you use in the clinic. The IPDA measures the reservoir, not active virus replication. This assay measures viral DNA in infected CD4 T cells, not free virus particles in the plasma. The IPDA is almost always positive, even in people on antiretroviral therapy who have plasma virus levels below the limit of detection. And the clinical utility of the IPDA is in the analysis of curative interventions as it measures the cells that are a barrier to cure. Now, one interesting discovery that was made with the IPDA is that the decay rate of cells with intact proviruses is actually more rapid than the decay of cells with defective proviruses, which essentially never decay. Now, this could indicate that there's some sort of immune pressure on infected cells during antiretroviral therapy. However, this decay is very slow. It's equivalent to the 44-month half-life that was originally measured with the viral outgrowth assay. So it's now becoming clear that the one reason the decay is slow is that infected cells can actually proliferate in vivo. Now, you remember that during responses to bacterial and viral antigens, the T cells that are capable of recognizing those antigens divide repeatedly. It was initially unclear whether infected CD4 T cells could divide. T cell activation can induce viral gene expression, and most productively infected cells die very quickly. However, recent studies have suggested that infected cells can proliferate during responses to bacterial and viral antigens. Now, some of these cells may turn on virus gene expression and be eliminated, but other cells just go on to proliferate, producing very large clones of infected cells. Evidence for proliferation of infected cells initially came from our analysis of residual viremia, which, as you recall, is the trace level of free virus in the plasma of patients on antiretroviral therapy. This is a phylogenetic tree of sequences of the RT gene from proviruses in resting CD4 T cells that we obtained at multiple time points from one of our treated patients. Now, this tree illustrates the vast diversity of viral sequences that arise during active virus replication that's due to the error-prone nature of reverse transcriptase. Now, here are the plasma sequences from different time points from the same patient. Now, some of these plasma sequences match the cellular sequences, consistent with the idea that residual viremia results from the daily activation of small numbers of latently infected cells, which produce virus that can infect new cells because of the drugs, but can be detected in the plasma with extremely sensitive assays. However, this is only part of the phylogenetic tree from this patient, and here's the rest of this tree. In this patient, 
And in about half of the patients that we've studied, the free virus particles in the plasma were often identical. That is, identical sequences that appeared without a single nucleotide change in multiple independent limiting dilution amplifications over a two-year period. And we thought that this had to reflect the extensive proliferation of infected cells, which would copy the integrated viral genome without error into progeny cells. Now, this work provided the first indication of what we now believe to be the major barrier to cure, the proliferation of latently infected cells. Definitive evidence for the in vivo proliferation of infected cells has come from the analysis of where the virus genome integrates into the host cell DNA. A critical step in the virus life cycle is the insertion of the viral genome into the host chromosome, and this is a step that's blocked by integrase inhibitors. In each newly infected cell, the viral genome inserts somewhere in the 3 billion base pair human genome. So if you find two cells with the same integration site, this almost certainly indicates that that infected cell has proliferated after integration. Now, these studies have also suggested that integration into particular host genes may actually drive this proliferation. However, we've recently shown that these large clones of infected cells are waxing and waning over a time course of years in patients. The discovery of infected cell proliferation has therefore changed our view of the reservoir. The latent reservoir was initially considered to be a very stable pool of quiescent cells, but it's now clear that the latent reservoir contains some very large clones of infected cells, as well as many smaller clones of infected cells, many of which we can't even detect or a level of sampling. And in fact, all or most of the cells in the reservoir may have some history of proliferation. And this is something that we need to understand. Now, it's most likely that this proliferation is due to the response of T cells to antigen and just appears to reflect the expansion and contraction of T cell clones. That's just part of the normal behavior of T cells. And so underlying the apparent stability of the latent reservoir are complex dynamics in which individual clones of infected cells are waxing and waning. And so to summarize this part, infected cells are able to proliferate in vivo, and this greatly complicates the problem of eradication. It appears that these cells can proliferate without turning on HIV gene expression. And so to eliminate the latent reservoir, we're going to have to figure out how to turn on HIV so the cells can be eliminated by viral cytopathic effects or by the immune system. Now, the most widely discussed cure strategy is called shock and kill. And the idea is to turn latent HIV back on so that the infected cells will die from the toxic effects of virus production or that the infected cells uh, will be recognized and killed by cytolytic T cells. Now, we know that T cell activation can reverse latency. This is how the latent reservoir was discovered. And this is that complicated molecular switch that regulates HIV gene expression and an inactivated T cell is on. The problem is, is that we cannot use global T cell activation because this would result in a cytokine storm and have many adverse effects for the patient. And so there's been interest in finding latency reversing agents or LRAs that will turn on HIV without global T cell activation. Now, some of these are entering clinical trials now, so I'll discuss them briefly. Now, most of them act on some part of this molecular switch um, to turn on HIV. Now, the best known LRAs are histone deacetylase inhibitors, some of which have been tested in clinical trials. Now, there's also TLR7 agonists, PKC agonists, and SMAC mimetics, all of which may work through the transcription factor NF-kappa B. Well, how will we know if these drugs are working? LRAs would be given to patients on antiretroviral therapy so that any virus that's released would not spread. An effective LRA should cause blips um, due to the activation of latent virus. Now, this would hopefully lead to a reduction in the latent reservoirs measured by assays like the QBOA or the IPDA. And if that reduction in the reservoir is substantial, um, there should be a delay in rebound um, upon treatment interruption. But so far, we've only had evidence that some LRAs cause blips, but there's been no significant reduction in the reservoir in clinical trials. However, some promising results have been reported in non-human primate studies. Now, here's an example of the histone deacetylase inhibitor aromadepsin that was given to patients on antiretroviral therapy. 
And for each dose, um, there was a transient increase in viremia, perhaps reflecting the reactivation of latent HIV. However, there was not any reduction in the latent reservoir. Now, one problem is that infected cells may not die after latency reversal. In other words, we not only have to find ways to shock viruses out of latency, but we also need to find ways to promote the killing of these cells by the immune system. So in this regard, there's been a lot of recent interest in broadly neutralizing antibodies to the HIV envelope protein. Now, on the surface of the HIV envelope part um, on HIV virus particle are spikes. And these spikes are composed of the HIV envelope protein, which at high resolution looks like this. Now the envelope protein binds to CD4 and uh, mediates viral attachment and entry. Antibodies that bind to the envelope protein can prevent infection. However, HIV um, evolves rapidly and there's tremendous heterogeneity in this protein in different infected individuals and even within a single individual. And this is one of the big problems with HIV vaccine development. However, recently several groups have been able to isolate broadly neutralizing antibodies that can neutralize many diverse HIV isolates. Now they arise in some infected individuals after a few years, but they're of little benefit to those people because the virus has already escaped. However, they can be um, passively infused into other patients and they produce a transient reduction in uh, viremia. Now, with regard um, to HIV cure research, they're of particular interest because they not only block new infection events, but they can also potentially target infected cells for destruction. Now, here are two of the best studied antibodies, VRCO1, which binds to and blocks the CD4 binding site on the envelope spike, and PGT121, which binds to a different region of the spike. Now, these antibodies can bind to free virus particles and neutralize them and prevent them from infecting C4 T cells. However, unlike small molecule inhibitors of HIV entry, antibodies have an additional effect. They can promote the killing of infected cells. The envelope spikes are expressed on the surface of the infected cell before the virus buds off and antibodies can bind and target the cell for lysis by natural killer cells. So this is one approach that's currently being tested to target the latent reservoir. And of course, this mechanism will have no effect on latently infected cells unless the cells are first activated in some way so that they can begin to make viral proteins. So we also need to find better latency reversing agents. Now I'd like to illustrate some of these concepts by talking about one of the clinical trials of a broadly neutralizing antibody. In this study uh, led by Katie Barr, individuals on long-term antiretroviral therapy were given the broadly neutralizing antibody VRCO1 just prior to and during an analytical treatment interruption to determine whether uh, the antibodies could prevent viral rebound. Measurements of the latent reservoir were done using the quantitative virus outgrowth assay, and they were done um, before the analytical treatment interruption and about six months after antiretroviral therapy had been restarted. And what they found uh, was that the broadly neutralizing antibody, VRCO1, was safe, but it caused only a very slight delay in rebound in some of the uh, study participants as compared to historical controls. Pre-existing or newly arising viral variants that were resistant to VRCO1 monotherapy were selected during the rebound. And the reservoir size was not changed, indicating that VRCO1 alone did not decrease the latent reservoir. And importantly, that short analytical treatment interruption did not increase the reservoir. And so to conclude, the latent reservoir in resting C4T cells is a major barrier to cure. Accurate measurement of the reservoir is important for evaluating cure interventions and requires distinguishing intact proviruses from defective ones. And this can be done with a novel assay, the IBDA. The reservoir is maintained by the proliferation of infected cells in response to antigens. And this is a very serious problem for cure efforts. Eliminating the reservoir through the shock and kill strategy will require finding better ways to turn on latent HIV and better ways to induce the killing of productively infected cells. Broadly neutralizing antibodies are of great interest in the HIV vaccine field and may also be useful to enhance killing of infected cells. I'd like to end by thanking our collaborators who contributed to the studies that I presented here today, and I would also like to acknowledge funding for the studies that I presented. Thank you very much.
low level block here. So don't have Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Janet. That was a fabulous presentation. Uh, several things flashed through my mind at once. Maybe the first thing was that uh, it's almost your clonal descriptions of the the pictures were almost like Jackson Pollock met George Seurat. So you've got a pointillistic uh, sort of artwork going on there. That was well done. Um, the, the the first thing also that came to my mind is I listened first. It's brilliant how both you and, and Bob and your entire team have just continued this remarkable story. And each time I see it, um, I'm, I'm just impressed with how we learn more as we go. And I know it's the whole field, but you guys are really leading the way. So congratulations on that. So my first, my first question is um, the obvious one. We Trip Gulick just told us about the Brazilian uh, patient who appears to be cured. It seems like you know, if you do the uh, IPDA analysis on that patient, you could look for intact virus, and that should tell us if he's genuinely cured. Is that accurate? That is accurate, um, and I, I I agree with you. Um, it was not done um, in this case, and so I agree that um, that actually would be a great way to see if he still has intact proviruses. Right, um, and... Uh, so what I'm thinking about, so that can be done just from peripheral blood, right? You just That's right. You get PBMCs and you put them, pull them aside and yes. there they are. Yes. Um, so, we also run the assay on um, cells from lymph nodes too. Um, right. So, but yes, it actually, it's, it's a, such a straightforward assay. Um, it could be readily done on small numbers of cells um, from peripheral blood. Right. So here's here's another question that um, that I had. I'm I'm not seeing the questions coming from the audience just yet. I'm sure they'll be here in a second. But um, when I think about one of the big topics that everyone talked about for quite a while, that I think you guys have pretty much debunked, is the notion that when people are on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, that there's no ongoing replication. Um, and some people said that there was low level, but you don't see resistance happening. You don't see breakthroughs happening after many years. So can you briefly address how we know that that's probably not at play? Yes, um, that's a great question. So uh, we've done a lot of pharmacodynamic studies of all the antiretroviral drugs and um, shown that the drugs are extremely effective um, in blocking, um, uh, inhibiting HIV infection, um, giving multi-log reductions um, in viral infection. And um, we also have showed, um, our, our group as well as other um, groups have shown that if you intensify a three-drug ART regimen by adding a fourth additional drug, uh, residual viremia does not decrease. So in addition um, to showing that there's no viral evolution um, in people who are adherent on an effective antiretroviral regimen, treatment regimen, there's no viral evolution and treatment intensification has no effect. And so we know now from uh, recent studies that most infected cells um, are coming um, from um, the proliferation of infected cells, um, not from de novo um, infection um, during antiretroviral therapy. So, right. yeah, that makes perfect sense. I have a question from uh, an audience member here. So, we've been telling patients that we treat acute HIV so that they may be more likely to respond to cure treatments in the future. Can you translate um, your findings into an answer for that question? Is that true that? we limit the reservoir by treating early? I, I think I think that the reservoir um, is definitely going to be smaller in those individuals treated during acute infection. Um, Dave Margolis um, essentially repeated um, uh, a longitudinal study of patients on antiretroviral therapy um, published this a few years back ago. Uh, many of the patients in that study were um, treated during acute infection. Um, they did have smaller reservoirs, but the half-life of lately infected cells was the same. The half-life, the decay, was still about 43 months. We found 44 months. So the reservoir will be smaller, but we're still left with the problem of this slow decay rate of this latent reservoir. 
Yeah, and that is a barrier to cure for sure. I was wondering, the, this next, uh, Sean was wondering, uh, what tissues in the body, latent reservoirs, hide uh, the virus? Words, where is it pretty much living? Yes. So, so the, it's, the, the reservoir is not a physical location. These cells, these infected cells, are continually circulating throughout the tissues. Um, so the cells, the lately infected cells, the infected cells that are in the blood today or in the tissues tomorrow and vice versa. Um, so we know for sure um, where we've looked, um, they're um, in lymphoid tissues. Um, in animal studies, non-human primate studies, um, they're in not only lymph nodes, but they're in the spleen. Um, uh, at pretty much the same level of infected cells, uh, lately right. infected cells. So these cells are continually circulating and that's their role um, to, uh, as they're circulating, trying to encounter their specific pathogen. So um, right. we know that they're also in the gall, in the gut associated lymphoid tissue as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm gonna be going into that with my resistance workshop here in just a little bit, that the notion is these cells, I, I call it like their, their, their train station. They come in and, and reside in these lymphoid tissues and then go back out, circulate, come back for a rest, that type of thing. Yeah, that, um, that's exactly right, yeah. Mike. Yeah. So um, a person who has started rapidly on art, you think you just addressed this, would have a smaller latent reservoir? Not necessarily, right? Because the time of the initial infection kind of blasts out there. I, I think absolutely the person would have a smaller reservoir. Um, uh, but we know from um, patients, for example, the Mississippi child, um, who started within hours of uh, after birth, um, had a very, very small reservoir, but yet rebounded um, a couple of years after coming off of antiretroviral therapy. So I, the reservoirs will most likely be smaller in people who start during acute infection. But I yeah. think it is established very early in infection. It almost has to be, right? That's how you get that big burst. And mm -hmm. uh, it seems like viral load is proportional to the number of cells in the body producing virus. So if you have a really high initial viral load with acute infection, there's a lot of cells already infected by that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I guess we can wrap up with this question. We'll go back to the, the mm -hmm. Sao, Sao Paulo patient. Um, what's your best guess about what's happening there? You dealt with the Mississippi baby. You just referenced yes. that. What are your thoughts about this Brazilian patient? Well, this is just a single person, a single case, um, and it hasn't been published. And so I think it's still too early to say whether this patient is cured or whether he's a post-treatment controller. Um, and we just have to wait um, and see. There's just not enough information to to understand. Yeah. If I had to put a nickel down, I'd say that it's probably, there's going to be rebound, but I bet if you did your uh, LPDA that we probably see some full length virus. Yeah, there. that would be, that would be wonderful to be able to do this assay, this new assay on right. this patient cells. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Congrats Thanks. to you and your Thank team you very for much. continuing you. your great work. It's great oh, to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank okay. you.